Hey everyone, Dr. McDown back again, going to talk to you a little bit more about running records, going to show you um, how they work, what they look like when they're being scored, let you practice doing some scoring, and we'll actually have a video of a child that you can score along with also for some practice. So hang on to your hats and get ready for uh, learning how to do a running record. Okay, so here's a little reminder about what the scoring looks like. This is a little different visual that I, I kind of like and think is helpful. So remember on our first video, we talked about, let me show you this here. We talked about the fact that um, whatever the child says goes on top and whatever uh, they should have said, basically the text says goes on the bottom and that line is in between. So when we are scoring our child, if they're reading correctly, it's just a check mark for every word they read correctly. If they leave a word out, that counts as one error. We're going to, uh, you can leave it blank, but I usually draw a line above to show that they actually omitted the word. Um, but what they should have said goes on bottom. So this is how we show that they left out a word, they omitted it. Sometimes they'll do just the opposite. They'll add in a word when nothing should be there. So you can see here what the child said is on top. What they should have said was nothing. So there's nothing there on the text. There's just a blank line. That's a scorable error also if they insert an extra word. Um, substituting is literally, this is what the child said on top and what they should have said is on the bottom. So in this example, went instead of want, and that is a scorable error for a substitution. Um, you'll notice that repetition, see how we've written it out here. Um, if you're going along and they're reading correctly and then they repeat, um, you can just box around those check marks. You don't have to write the words underneath. You just write an R for repetition and box around the words that they repeated. And this is the normal way that I've seen it scored. This is another possibility, but I prefer this one where you box around it. Um, that's not a scorable error. It's just a behavior, again, that we want to recognize that sometimes um, they're using repetition. Repetition is actually a strategy that we teach students to use when they um, you know, are reading along and maybe it doesn't make sense to them or it's not sounding right or, or uh, maybe to help them clarify. Sometimes I just go back and start over and, and uh, that's not a bad thing unless it's excessive and they're doing it too much. So we do wanna make note of it so we can see if they're over or under using it. And of course, then the self-correction, this can get a little tricky sometimes. Let me kind of zoom in on this and we'll look at this self-correction section. So you can see that a child reading along correctly and then they say the instead of there and then they realize it, so self-correct. You, you honestly don't have to put self-correct and a check mark. Um, there's a lot of fine line when you're trying to decide if a student is self-correcting or not. Um, and so my best advice is when you're trying to decide, is it a self-correction or not? Um, are they still decoding the word? Are they still trying to figure it out? and making attempts. And as part of that, maybe they say something wrong and then they figure it out. I would just give them the check mark. If it sounds like, you know, the final answer, like, is, that, um, is this your final answer? I don't know what game show that is. But if, if they've made their, their, if they've read the word and they're getting ready to move on, but then they realize it and they go back and self-correct, that's when, that's a true self-correction. So sometimes we have lots and lots of things that are scored as self-corrections when it's really them just still trying to figure out the word. Like in this example here, they're reading along, check, check, check. And then all of a sudden the word is her, but first they say me, then they say him, then they say his. If they finally said her, I would just put a check mark there. I wouldn't necessarily call that a self-correction because they're still trying to figure out the word and they've made multiple attempts. If they finally get it right, I would give them the check mark for getting it correct. Um, if they said his and they're getting ready to go on and then they go back or maybe even as they're self-correcting as they repeat, you see how they went back and repeated this whole phrase and in the process they self-corrected, but that I could, I could um, agree with, but sometimes we get a little too crazy with the self-correction thing. 
And just as a side note, whenever you have to uh, mark a self-correction, it's also something you have to analyze for the queuing system. So you put a little bit of extra work on yourself that you don't really need to. So there is that. Um, <clears throat> again, here's the appeal. When they ask for help, they ask for a word. And um, we want to notate that they asked for that. That does still count as an uh, omission if they don't read the word and they just ask for help. There are basically three things that you can do if, um, if they ask for help. I'm gonna zoom in. Um, oh yeah, I forgot I put this in here. See, this is a lot easier to see. Um, you can see that, um, again, what the child reads is on top, what they should have read or what's on the text is on the bottom. There's some you know, accurate, Omission, insertion, substitution. Those are the main errors that you're going to see right there. That's most of what you'll be scoring. And it's not that difficult, right? You can kind of tell that it, it's not too bad. And then here you see the repetitions, the self-corrections. Notice that says no error. None of these things are errors. Now, honestly, the fact that they ask for help is not an error. But if you... Um, help them instead of encouraging them to try it and give them the word or they just don't read the word, then this counts as an omission. And so it would be a scorable error. But just the act of them asking themselves themselves saying, what's that word? That is not a scorable error. It's what happens after that. So here's what to do. Bless their hearts. We're, we feel so bad for them. We know they're stressed out and they're trying to do this test and you're timing them, even if you're trying to be covert about it. And we don't want them to be stressed out. And so we want to help, right? But it's an assessment and we want to know what they can do. So if we help them, our data is really not valid. So we have to be very careful about that. So really when they ask for help, they ask for an appeal, um, then you could say, well, well you try it, right? Now they're having all these markings like YT for you try or teacher. I don't know that I, that is all that necessary, but um, um, you, you can use that if you want to. Sometimes we get a little um, overly detailed with all these markings and things, but you can basically just encourage them to try it. Okay, say, well, just do the best you can or what does it look like? Try, try your best, right? Um, so the word is box and he says boy, but he asked for help first. Then he made an attempt boy. Um, and then maybe he self-corrected and said box. Okay. So that might happen. Or he omits it completely. He asks for help and you say, well, you try. And then he tries it and gets it right. So you give him the check mark. So you can see there's no error in that. But now if you, if he asks for help and you tell him, then that's where you're gonna, he's gonna ask for help. And maybe you say, well, you try it. And then he says the wrong word, he substitutes. And then you tell him the answer. It's still gonna count as a substitution because he substituted one word for another. Um, but if you teacher told, then you'd mark that there. That does count as an error, okay? He got the wrong word, he asked for help, but then you got him to go ahead and try. He, got, he tried, he got it wrong. That's just a substitution. And um, remember we talked about sometimes if they get off track or get on my study, well, let's try that again. So you can see um, how first he said, he read hit like bug and you know, let's try that again. And he goes back and then he reads it correctly. You're gonna count one error because of the do over. So that's an example of that. Okay. This is an example that's just in the textbook of what a running record looks like. This is uh, when they when you do have a form that has the story in there for you, it's really nice and it's handy. They don't always do that for you. It might, it might just be a blank form, either way it's fine. If it is there in a traditional true running record, the markings are out to the side. The reason this is important is if you didn't have the story here, the way you can tell later when there's just a bunch of check marks, the way that you can tell if the uh, how the markings match up with the story is because if there's one, two, three, four, five, six words on this line, there's gonna be six markings on this line. See, one, two, three, four, five, six. 
And on the second line, one, two, three, four, five words. So there's only gonna be five markings on the second line. It all lines up. So if I didn't have this story right next to this to look at, I just had this blank form. I could go back later and look at that story and I could tell um, what this check mark means because I could go back to the fourth, oops, sorry. I could go back to the fourth word on the, on the story here and tell um, what word is the fourth word and that matches up with my check mark. So I could, I could be reading here and I go, well, what's this word? For this check mark right here oh it's the word hack and so that's why it's really important that you do the markings this way and in lines so whether you have the story or you don't have the story you've got everything you need you can see how they did the scoring they they counted that number of errors row by row and self corrections and then this, the queuing system so that's all consistent we're going to do that on the third video when we learn how to score so just wanted to remind you kind of what it should look like, whether you use my form that I've provided that has the story next to it. I don't want you marking it on top. I want you marking it out to the side so that you can really know how to do that in case you don't have a form with the story typed in for you. Uh, it's kind of a crutch and, and I don't want you to get um, dependent on it. I want you to be able to do it the right way, whether you have that form or not. So basically, getting ready to do this. So let's talk about the three basic steps when you're doing a running record. The first one, you're just going to record a student as they read orally. You're gonna use those check marks and other markings. And then you're going to examine every error and every self-correction to um, determine which queuing systems they're using and they're not using, which one's prompted an error, which one's prompted a self-correction, all that kind of thing. It'll tell us so much about them as a reader. And then lastly, we're going to determine based on all of that analysis, whether the passage is at the student's intent, independent level, instructional level, or too difficult frustration reading level. So let's do a little practice. And I did um, find these little um, practice things online from this Institute of Education Sciences. So I really appreciated that. I thought I would just use their examples because they were pretty good. So, Here's an example where um, in the running record, the text says a boy had a pet fly. He named him Fly Guy. We love those books, don't we, Fly Guy? And the student read it this way. A kid had a pet, a pet fly. He called, named him Fly Guy. So this is how we would mark it. The first line where he said a kid had a pet, a pet fly. A was correct. He said kid instead of boy. So what do we call that? Substitution, right? Had a pet, he read correctly, but then he went back and repeated it, a pet, and then correctly read fly. You see that? Then on the second row, he said, he called, named him fly guy. So he is correct. And then he said, called, and then he said, named. So that's himself correcting. First he said he called, and then he realized that, well, that doesn't even look like called. So he self-corrected and said, named him fly guy. Those two last three words correct. Okay, so actually no scorable errors here at all, right? Up here, one scorable error, the substitution. Pretty easy so far, right? Okay, let's do another one. Okay. <clears throat> So the text is supposed to read, one day Buzz said, it's time to take a road trip. So first thing the student says is, what's that word? And the teacher says, well, you try. And so he says on, and then the teacher, this is in principle, the teacher says one, and then he reads, one day Buzz said, it's time to take a trip today. So that's how he read that. This one's a lot more tricky to score, isn't it? And this is why uh, people get kind of stressed out when it gets a little tricky like this. Um, but remember, you'll get better the more you do it. So first, he asked for the appeal. He asked for the word, right? That's why we had the A there. Of the word, he didn't say the word, right? So technically an omission. He should have said the word one. He didn't say it. <coughs> Excuse me. He asked for help. The teacher said, well, you try. And what did he say? He said on. And um, so then the teacher told him the word. 
And um, then he said, one day, but wait, day buzz said. Now, the trick here is we're not going to count it against him twice. He, he omitted it the first time, asked for help. The teacher said, well, you go ahead and try it. And he said it and it was wrong. So then she went ahead and gave him the word because it's the first word of the story. I think she didn't want him to get frustrated right off the bat. She didn't have to give him the word, uh, but she did. Uh, either way, it counts as an omission because he, or you technically could count it as a substitution, right? But it's only going to be one or the other. We're not going to count it against him twice. So um, then the next line, it says, it's time to take a road trip. He says, it's time to take a trip today. That's kind of tricky. So it's time to take a, he doesn't say road. He skips road, right? There's the omission and then says trip. And then he adds a word today. See that it's an insertion. So he's got an omission and an insertion. Now, this is kind of interesting because the sentence is, it's time to take a road trip. He says, it's time to take a trip today. Really doesn't change the meaning a whole lot. And you can tell that the, the sentence still makes sense. It, maybe in his mind, that sounded right to him. That was more natural. And that's just kind of how it came out because he wasn't looking carefully enough at it. So, okay. All right, now let's practice. You take a piece of paper, just get out a little scrap piece of paper and do these four lines. A boy had a pet fly. He reads, the, the boy has a pet fly. How would you score that? Try that one. And then he named him Fly Guy. He names him Fly Guy. Score that. Fly Guy could say, and he, he said, Fly Guy can say, could say, and the last line is the boy's name, Buzz, the little boy's name, Buzz. So let's see if you score those four lines of text and then I'll let you compare it with the answer I'm getting ready to show. Here we go. Okay, how did you do? Compare yours with this one. What did he do? He substituted the for a, right? So we do a substitution and he read correctly, boy. Then he said has instead of had, another substitution, a pet fly. So two errors on that first row. And then he named him fly guy. He said he names him fly guy. So one substitution there, scorable error. So that's two scorable or one scorable error. So three all together now. The third row, uh, he says, fly guy can say, and then he goes back and repeats and says, could say. So see how he's repeating this little two word phrase to, to self-correct. So there you go. So no scorable error, but we see the behavior, how he's repeating as he's self-correcting. And then the little boy's name, Buzz. He added an extra word, didn't he? This is real common. Instead of just saying the boy's name, Buzz, for some reason, he just thought it needed to say the little boy's name. It just sounded right to him. It was what seemed natural. And so he just added in that extra word, probably never even realized he did it. And so we just add that extra word. That is one scorable error. So altogether, they had one, two, three, four scorable errors out of that story. Let's try another. This one's a little trickier. So I'm gonna give you a minute to look at it. <clears throat> Instead, one day Buzz said, first thing he does is says, what's that word? Then the teacher says, but you try. It's time to take a nap. One day Buzz says, it is, it's time for a row, row, road trip, road trip. Tricky. If you got it, you can pause while you think about it. I'm going to go ahead and move on. Okay, let's see how you did. First, he omits the word, asks for help. Teacher says, well, you try it. And so he reads, 
one day. So he self corrects. She see she's calling that a self correction. I don't think I would, but um, I mean, for all intents and purposes, it doesn't matter. Except then we have to determine what queuing system made him self correct, and I don't know that we can really tell. But if he asks for help, and you say, "Well, you go ahead and try it," you know, and he tries it and gets it right, I would give him the check mark there. So one uh, day Buzz says, and it should have been said, so there's a substitution there. So if you put a check mark there and says self-correction, you did good. If you put self-correction there, it's okay. He, he did eventually get it. Instead of omitting, he self-corrected in her eyes. I would just call that him finally making the attempt with some encouragement, got it right. I wouldn't call that a self-correction. Um, let's see. It is instead of it's substituted, but then he self-corrects. See, he says it is it's. So he first said it is, then he self-corrected, said it's time for, and it's supposed to be two. And then he uh, skips the word take because he's saying it's time for a road trip, road trip, right? When it's supposed to be, it's time to take a road trip. So again, it may just be, you know, what sounds natural to him is a little different than the way it's written. And so um, he's maybe reading more for meaning. And so he's not looking word for word. And so he's, he's reading it in the phrasing that makes more sense to him. So it's not really a terrible thing that he's making this kind of error. It's just when you're um, being assessed for accuracy, then it counts against you. And that's one of the problems we have with all the benchmark tests. Okay, so he, he omits the word take because that makes this next word um, A. And then he starts to say road, but he kind of stumbles over it. So we want to show all the attempts. If he takes them a couple of tries before they actually get the word, we want to write that there because that's a behavior we're observing. So here's his attempts and he gets it. Give him the check mark. Road, and he says road trip. But then you can see they boxed around that and put repeat R because he said road trip, road trip, probably to kind of cement in his thinking because he stumbled over it and he realizes he kind of stumbled over it when he says road, road, road trip, road trip, right? So he's just kind of finalizing his thoughts on it. So um, that's not a bad thing that he's repeating there. It's kind of helping him to, to make sense of it. Okay, but see how it's a little bit trickier. As scoring, right? Okay, now we're gonna try one with a real child here in just a second. Um, I'm gonna show you the forms to use and then give you a chance to actually uh, watch a live child reading, which is a lot harder because you have to keep up with them reading and not just um, look at what they said later and score it. So um, just a second, I'm gonna pause here and get things ready and then we'll do that. Okay, so what we're going to do is give you a chance to get a blank sheet of paper or you can use the form that I've provided that has the story here and has room out to the side for you to, um, to do the scoring. And so if you're in my class, you have this form available to you. If not, you can take a little screenshot of it or you can just use a blank sheet of paper. Um, I wanna make sure that you realize that this is not what a child would read from, okay? It's really important that the child sees a story that is developmentally appropriate as far as font size and all that kind of thing. So when we're doing a, a reading like this, this is what the actual story looks like that the little boy in the video you're about to watch is actually uh, looking at. He's seeing the story this way with a little picture to help um, him comprehend the story and the title is nice and big and the font size is bigger and it's broken down into some little paragraphs for him. So the only thing that we've done on the form here is put the words on the lines in the same, uh, same number of words on each line, just like it is in the story. So that when we do our check marks, if we're using a blank sheet of paper, it'll, it'll work just the same. So give me a second. I'm going to actually uh, pull up the video and put it side by side with this picture of the story 
so that you guys online that maybe don't have the actual uh, paper to look at can can watch the the story while you do the markings so give me a second to get that set up okay here we go we have a little boy named isaiah here he's a first grader i believe first or second grader and uh, she's about to do um, an assessment on him we're going to use it as a running record um, she is prefacing the assessment by activating prior knowledge so you'll notice that in the video that she asks him a little bit about it i don't think she does a very good job with it so i don't want you to get the impression that she does a great job because she really doesn't um, but she is trying to help him think about what he's getting ready to read about and what it's like to have a kitten and that kind of thing so I think what I don't like about it is so once she finally gets a response from him, she just very abruptly, you know, like, okay, cool, and then moves on. And so I don't know that she paid a lot of attention to what he actually said. Um, so you can see that for yourself in the video. The other thing that you'll you'll see is that um it takes him a little while to come up with his thoughts or ideas or whatever. And and you're gonna have kids like that. The other thing that I apologize for, this is not my video, it's a training video that I've received with the textbook, and there's terrible background noise, terrible background noise. And so it just uh, begs for the conversation that it is really important where you do your testing. Uh, testing environment is huge. And when you have thin walls where they can hear the secretaries and everyone talking through the walls on the other side and you have train horns blasting and all this stuff and she's you know timing him and all the things going on it's it's very overwhelming and distracting and a lot of kids they don't handle that well so uh, i do want to bring your attention to that but for now just um here's the story hopefully you have either the running record form that i provided or you have a blank sheet of paper so that you can do the markings with us um, if you're one of my students then you should have the, the copy of the markings so that you can use that as kind of a, a guide if you forget how to mark things and i'm going to play the video and just let you hear the whole exchange um, we won't listen. I think she does some comprehension afterwards, but we're not going to look at that for a running record because that's not part of a running record. So here we go. Get your pencils ready and just do the best you can. And then we'll come back and compare notes. Some stories for me, okay? And... I want to try this story here called Pat and the Kitten. Okay, and I want you to, when you're reading this story, we're, I'm going to ask you some questions after you're done. So I want you to try to remember what you read. But this is a story about a kitten and a girl named Pat. What's it like to have a kitten? Good. Why? Because... Cool. Okay, I want you to read this story to learn about the girl named Pat and her kitten. Can you read it out loud for me? Pat saw a kitten. It was on the it was on the side of the street it was sitting under a blue car come here little kitten pet said the kitten looked up at Pat. It had big yellow ears. P 
cat took her um under the car. She saw that her eggs was we're not going to listen to the comprehension part um although i will tell you that he doesn't do too bad of a job on the comprehension so uh give me a minute and we'll get back to our uh, powerpoint and look at the scoring see how you did okay let's see how you did so here's how i scored it and I'm just showing you the, the preliminary stuff. A lot of times your story will have numbers to show how many words so you can get a running word count. This one didn't. So I just put my own numbers in here. So that's what those numbers are. Don't let that confuse you. So I started <clears throat> with on the first line, uh, he repeated, right? When he got here, he said, Pat saw a kitten. It was on the side of, and then he went, right. I think he said it was on the, then he wasn't sure of the word side. So he stopped. He went back. This is a strategy he's obviously learned. He went back to the beginning of the sentence and said it was on the, and then he got side of the. So he actually has no errors on that first row. See, so there's no, no number out here. I didn't, I didn't count any scoreable errors. But I did show the behavior that he used repetition to go back and help him figure out. And maybe it's he went back to the beginning of the sentence to see what made sense there and, and looked like that word. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> next row, I circled a couple of words that he really struggled with and that took him a long time. But I also did that because one of the important things about a running record is that we want to uh, make note of behaviors and especially decoding behaviors and things. And he, on these three words, side and street and sitting, he spent a lot of time on them. So I didn't want just the check mark to make it look like he had those words with automaticity. He did get them correct, but he struggled with those, but he was able to decode them. He was able to figure out those words with the strategies that he knew. So I think it's important to do that, to make notes about those kinds of things. Um, <clears throat> again, so the first three rows, he has no, no um, scorable errors at all. We get down here and he says it had big yellow. And if you noticed in the video, he looked down at the picture. Now the picture is black and white, it's not in color. So that probably didn't help him to figure out what was yellow. But then he said, ears instead of eyes. That's his first error. He substitutes ears for eyes. And I find that really interesting because it's a logical um, substitution. It looks very similar. It also makes sense. The cat couldn't have big yellow ears, although it looks like it's a black cat, but maybe he's not really thinking about that. 
Um, so it, it's it's a reasonable response for a little seven year old to to make. The other thing you'll notice I did is I timed it. So here's the one minute mark, and that will come into play later when I show you how what we can do with that. So I just marked it here. I put this was the last word he read at the one minute mark, and I just marked that. Um, the next error that he makes is um, is right here, and it's kind of tricky because it sounds like he says "ul" and then "eggs." You can barely hear the "l," so you might just think he said eggs instead of leg, which is kind of weird. Like why would the cat have eggs? But I think he says legs. I think he just broke it down and look eggs. Either way, it's a substitution because it's only one leg. And so uh, we don't have to worry about whether he said eggs or whether he said legs. It's still a substitution and a scorable error. So you can see he has one error here, one error here. And then this word hurt, um, I didn't circle it, I underlined it because that one I actually marked with an LP, that's the code I use for long pause and I write that in the margin of my test, just to show that it was an omission, but he might, he spent a long time trying to figure out that word. Now you have to give it to this lady that's doing the assessment because she has some incredible wait time, doesn't she? And I don't know that I would have had quite that much uh, patience or wait time because it looked like he kind of gave up trying. He was just kind of looking at the word, kind of like, oh, please, somebody tell me this word. So I, to me, if they're not making an effort anymore, I would go ahead and, and give that to them. But because um, he's he seems like maybe the kind of child that's not going to ask for help. Like he's just going to quit trying. But, you know, she could see him better than I could. And maybe he was still trying to figure it out. So I put the LP for long pause there, but ultimately the dash for um, omission, he left out the word and I put the TT or some people just put a T for teacher told. So she gave him that word. It counts as a scorable error. It would count technically as an omission. And then again, this word care, he figures out on his own, it takes him some time and he doesn't note it. He doesn't recognize it quickly or with automaticity. So I made note of that. And then, uh, but no scorable errors on that row. It's a little crowded, sorry. And then he says, she put her head and then it sounds like he says head and. It's real hard to hear, but it sounds like he self-corrects that. It's one of those things you'd almost want to go back and listen to multiple times to make sure what he said. Um, but it's funny because he says she put her, um, head hand on the kitten he thinks that's the end of the sentence and he realizes oh there's more and then he so it makes him say kitten and you kind of hear the finality in his voice and then he realizes oh the sentence isn't over and he self-corrects says kittens and then soft black fur and then the reads the rest of it with accuracy and on this last row he says the and then repeats the kitten gave a happy and just like up here on hurt, he had no clue how to figure out the word meow. He's the really long pause that the, the assessor finally gave him the word. So we show omission and then teacher told, and that is a scorable error. Um, I found it interesting, the word hurt and the word meow, he wasn't able to decode those. He wasn't able to come up with some kind of strategy for those, but those have a little bit more advanced spelling features in them. The hurt has that R controlled sound in there. He may not be familiar with yet at first grade. Um, and then the meow, that's a kind of, you know, we, we teach kids first about the long vowel patterns where there's two vowels together and it usually only says the first sound. And this is kind of a rule breaker to that, the meow. And uh, that's a two syllable word. It just, it's not a traditional a word for him and I think it confused him and uh, if he had maybe thought about what made sense there that might have helped but uh, he did a pretty good job overall so uh, that's what the markings would look like and then he would have one two three four actual scorable errors that were not self-corrected he has two um, scorable errors that were no longer scorable because he self-corrected them so Four errors to self-corrections is how that would be marked. 
So hopefully that helps you to kind of see how you did um, on your scoring. I'd like to share just a few suggestions from Mari Clay. She's the one that invented the running record. And um, it's just some things from her book that talks about things to do to get better at running records. And one thing she says is just to practice all the time, uh, but not, not on a really low level reader or a really high level reader. When you're practicing to get better, you need just kind of an average reader. The one that is uh, a really struggling reader, it's difficult because they'll make sometimes really um, uh, difficult kinds of, uh, of errors that are difficult to score. And the really high reader, they're just hard to keep up with because they read fast. So just, you know, you might even just find a friend and just say, hey, can you just read? And on every line, just make one or two errors for me so I can kind of practice, you know, get one of your kids at home if you have one and and give them some help, have them help you with your homework that way, right? Um, but just practice. The more you do it, the easier the markings will come. It, it might seem difficult now, but it will get better. Um, Mari Clay says, don't have that printed text on the score form because it'll, she says, it will keep you from noticing the behaviors that it distracts. Like you might have noticed that Isaiah in the film there, he, uh, or in the video, he, um, he looked down at the picture. Um, he, at the very beginning, whenever she was asking him what it's like to have a cat or whatever, did you notice that he got real distracted and, and it was because he saw her mark something down? And I think maybe that concerned him, like, was my answer bad? You know, you really don't want to have your paper sitting there in front of the child and doing markings on it. It's really better to say, uh, you know, have that up kind of on a clipboard up by your chest or something where they're not looking at it and say things like, you know, while you're reading, I'm going to write down all the great stuff I see you do so we can talk about it afterwards or something like that. So that if they see you mark something down, they're not immediately going into panic mode. So anyway, um, I know that she says this, but honestly, when you're starting out, it's just so much easier to have that um, support of that text close to where you're marking. It just makes it's so much easier, but um, <clears throat> but that is one of the things that she says not to do because she wants you to really focus on all the behaviors that you'll notice the student doing, like the really long pausing and and are they squinting? Are they leaning in? Are they using their finger to track? All that kind of stuff, and you may not be paying enough attention attention to those behaviors. And all of those things are important and should be written all over your form in, in little notes. Um, she also says don't tape record. She says it's a crutch. You don't have the visual later. So if you're recording it so you can go back later and, and do the scoring or, or confirm your scoring, um, you don't see all the behaviors and that kind of thing. And I agree. But uh, as far as like my students, I think sometimes having an audio recording, um, we don't video record because we don't have IRIs for that. Or I, sorry, we don't have the institutional review board, the IRB. Um, to, to allow that, but um, it's not a bad thing if you have an audio recording that you can go back and kind of check your markings until you get better at it. So I don't know if I agree with that either. I think sometimes that can be helpful. However, if you've got a lot of background noise and things like that, you can't really depend on that audio recording because it may not be that great and you might not hear uh, real subtle things like when Isaiah was saying the L before he said eggs you almost don't hear it. And when he corrected um, head and hand, um, it's very hard to hear some of those things and they might not be audible on the on a recording. Um, one thing, and we'll learn about this as we learn the next part about scoring the queuing systems, is you can't analyze omissions or insertions on the queuing systems. But um, you want to think about it and you want to I'll show you how to mark that later, but it's just something we can't, we can't tell why they omit a word or why they insert a word. There could be a lot of reasons, but there's no evidence that we can provide. So that's something about the scoring. Um, it's really good on, with students to do running records on easy level text and then instructional level and then harder, harder instructional level. So you can kind of get a sense of, um, 
you know, how they do when the text is a little more easy? Do they make careless errors or what do they do when it's a little more difficult? Um, doing nonfiction versus fiction text and comparing that. It's good to do all of those things, change it up. Don't ever make a big instructional decision or a um, life altering decision of a child based on one running record. You need a series of them. So collect um, that data. Remember that progress monitoring chart, that kind of thing. Um, one thing that you can do if you have a really fast reader and you're trying to mark the um, the running record, you can always go back in later and fill in the bottom part, like what the actual word was. So if you have a, a student that's reading really fast and they say went instead of want, just put went at the top and draw the line and keep doing your check marks. You can go back when you're all finished and the assessment's over and you can fill in the bottom part. And that helps whenever you're doing something that's really fast and you're trying to keep up with the fast reader not worrying about the actual text because you can always look at the text later and get that information. Even if you're doing it on a library book that they're reading and you don't have the book, take a little screenshot of the page that they're reading and you can put that with it later. So those are just some tips from Mari Clay for what they're worth. And that's all of this section of the video. We're going to do the last part where we're going to go into the detail about queuing systems and um, what they are what they tell us, how to score them, all of that stuff. So that will be in part three of running records.